Part 7 Before the land, there is the ice, vast and wheeling, mindless and all-consuming. The same ice that devoured Shackleton's endurance, swallowing the big ship meter by meter until it snapped her spine, orphaned her crew, and left them to wander the mercurial topography of the pack. They camped upon it, and it split beneath them as they slept. They tried to hold a line toward the shore, only to be spun outward again and again. The ice had nearly broken them before they had set foot on the continent, and these were experienced men. So for all our brave talk and bragging over the course of our journey south, when the day came that the Beacon Hill would meet the leading edge of it, we were silent, waiting with our eyes fixed on the horizon, searching for evidence of that glittering hem. Looking from face to face, I could see the men shared the same dread, the same doubt, I had seen in Leroy, and I knew all too well in myself. But none dared voice it, each silently believing that to admit fear, no matter how universal, was to invite defeat as if the hull of our solidarity might be breached by those frozen thoughts. As evening swept over us, Gorwind ordered we spill wind, and the hill slowed. But our new midnight held no stars, only a haze of rose and amber light that marked where the sun had dipped. And against that milky brightness, the sea was made a featureless void. Then, chips of light broke from the edge of the sky. The first ice had appeared, like a regiment, simultaneously swarming outward from its vast mother from horizon to horizon. Those who still slept were drawn back to the deck by the thump and scrape of lonely growlers running along the keel and bobbing up behind us, their slick, clear skulls barely cresting the waves upon which they rode. In their wake, I saw that the water had begun to fog with clouds of half-formed crystals. The hill was cutting through a growing ocean of slush, and the crisp slap of waves that had attended us for so many weeks was slowly replaced by the uneasy rasping of these swells, and the rip of thin ice plates that followed atop them, splintered by the bow. Our eyes were led outward as we watched the sea assembling itself into these seeming stones, and the men called out in awe as they spotted enormous alabaster tables the size of farmhouses, bowed columns and daggers of ice that rose above our masts, and between it all, a crash of shattered porcelain that threatened with every glazing wave to fuse with itself and pen us in. Hours passed and worry deepened into my chest that it would never stop, that the ice would overwhelm us then and there. But as Leroy finally came above decks, looking pale and leaning heavily on a makeshift cane, there was a shout. Ahead, a dark river had revealed itself before the bowsprit, a rippling path that led to the very limits of our vision, straight to the razor-edged limb of the world and I stood mute beside my captain as that line took shape, piling upon itself, swelling and uneven, until it became a gleaming white range. I was breathless. It was as if we had attended creation itself. I turned to say as much to Leroy, but he had started back down again, even as cheers rose up between the men. I joined in. The ice had opened its arms to us. We had arrived in Antarctica. <laughs>